Hello, new or potential new Darktable user. My name is Bruce Williams, and this is Understanding Darktable. This is the second of two videos aimed at being a newbie's introduction to Darktable 3.4. In episode 84, we looked at the light table, and in this episode, we're going to look into the dark room. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 85 of Understanding Dark Table. In the last video, we looked at the light table view. In this episode, we're gonna look at processing your raw files, or your JPEGs if you so choose, in the dark room view. For this, I've chosen an old image I shot with Tegan a couple of years ago. And again, if you've come from Lightroom, this is gonna look very similar. Thumbnail view in the top left, we then have a bunch of modules on the left and right hand sides and our histogram in the top right hand corner. So let's work our way through this. The snapshots module we will come back to later in the video. The history module is where you can see all of the things that have been done to an image. Now I mentioned this in episode 69, I'll mention it again. A lot of people who are new to Darktable freak out when they come into a brand new image that they've just imported and they find there's about eight history items here in the history stack. And it'll be things like raw black and white point, demosaic, input color profile, output color profile, display encoding, highlight reconstruction, orientation. And they go, why has all this stuff been done? And it's because, as I explained before, these things are always happening in every other photo editor you've ever used as well. It's just that most other software hides all of that from the user because those are things that have to happen for a raw file to actually be displayed on your screen. So they're always happening. And because they can't be removed and they can't be modified, most software doesn't show you. Darktable is all about transparency. And so you get to see all of those things, even if you can't remove them from the history stack. Anything that you then do in the way of processing with various modules will become these higher order history states. If at any point you want to reset an image, like let's suppose I want to reset this image because I want to reprocess it from scratch. We can click the reset parameters button on the history module, and that will reset this raw file, as we're about to see, with these 12 things that have happened. Now, as you can see, the look of the image has changed a little bit, and part of that is to do with some preferences that I've got set in my copy of Darktable. So this is not necessarily straight out of camera. It's had a couple of things done to it. As you can see, filmic RGB and exposure have been applied. Color calibration has been applied. And there are dedicated videos in my playlist that cover those things. All right, the duplicate manager. This is a great feature. Think back to the days of analog film, okay? You shot a roll of film, you then processed it with chemicals, and you ended up with a neg strip. And you would then put that neg strip through an enlarger, shine a light through it, get some photoreactive paper, and voila, you have a print. The beauty of the neg is that it can never be changed. It could never be modified. All you could do was alter the way you process that neg and generated a print. The same can be said for the digital world. I've got a raw file here and I might choose to process it. Well, let's say I'm happy with this process. I'm actually not, but let's suppose I was. But I then decide I want to try an alternate process of this image, but I don't want to lose what I've already got. I can click on duplicate. And that will create a new XMP sidecar file. Now, I didn't mention this in the last episode, but I did go into it in great depth in episode 69. So if you're not familiar with what an XMP sidecar file is or why it's important, definitely watch episode 69. So now I've got a duplicate image 
that still only references the same raw file. Now, my raw files out of my Sony a7 III, they weigh in at about 40 megabytes per file. This duplicate that I've created, that's not 40 megabytes. It's a couple of kilobytes at most because the X, that's the XMP file. And this allows me to now go and do something completely different with this image. Maybe I don't want filmic. Maybe I wanted to use an RGB curve instead. So, you know, I, I do something like this and then maybe I decide, yeah, maybe I want it monochrome or maybe I want to do something else. And as you can see, I've now got two different versions of the same image. And if I go back to my light table, we will see if I now zoom in here. Where are you, Tegan? There you are. These are the same two raw files, but just two different processed versions, and I can then export them accordingly, or I might export both of them. So that's the beauty of the duplicate manager. It simply creates this extra little XMP file. Like I said, it's only about you know, 10 or 20 kilobytes or something. They're, they're tiny anyway. And you can have as many of those as you want for processing different versions of the one raw file. So like I said, it's like having a neg and choosing to create different prints. You might do a color print and then the next day do a black and white print. Who knows? All right, if you want to get rid of that, you can simply click on the X and that will remove that XMP file from Darktable. It won't delete the XMP file from your file system. But like I said, they are tiny. They don't take up a whole lot of room. You could go and manually delete them from your file browser if you choose to. Next up, we've got the color picker. As you would imagine, that is useful if you want to take a color reading from anywhere in the image. You can choose whether you want to select an area or just a point. You can choose minimum or maximum values or just a mean value of an area if that's what you want. You can choose the color space through which you sample. You get the idea. Tagging, again, this is like a duplicate of the tagging module from the light table view. You can add tags to a single image whilst you're in the darkroom view if you need to. Then we've got image information. Again, that's exactly the same as the image information module from the light table view. And finally, the mask manager. And that really only comes into play when you start playing with masks within some of the development modules. I said we would revisit the snapshots module later in the video, so let's do that now. Let's suppose I think of this as my starting point for this image, but I want to try some other things. Let's say for some reason I don't want to create a duplicate, I just want to take a snapshot of where we're at now. So I click on the take snapshot button. And that will create a snapshot and it will name it Exposure 12. And that relates to the current history state item. So now I can go ahead and do any other processing I like to this image. So let's suppose I wanted to... I'm, I'm actually going to go over to the color calibration module and I am going to create a monochrome mix of this image that looks something like that. Now, if I want to compare where I am currently at with my processing against the snapshot, I simply go back to the snapshot and left click once on this entry for exposure 12. And that gives me a split view of where I was when I took that snapshot on the left and where I am now on the right. When I mouse over this line, you'll notice that right in the middle there is a little circular arrow icon that allows me to choose between a vertical split or a horizontal split. And if I click again, I can now have my current state on the left and my history state on the right. You get the idea. If at any point you decide I'm done with this, you can simply click the reset parameters and the old history state will be thrown away. Now, 
I do need to clarify that this particular module, the snapshots module, only captures a bitmap of the image as it stood at that point in time. So you'll notice that if I zoom in on my current processed state, the snapshot does not zoom in because it's just a bitmap capture of where the history was at that particular point in time. And I cannot get back to that history state through the snapshots module. That is not its intent. So if you think I want to try an alternate process, use the duplicate manager. All right, let's just move on. So now we look at the processing modules. There is in Darktable 3.4 a new manage presets window. I covered all of this in my uh, four part series on Darktable 3.4 new features. I don't remember the exact episode numbers, but I think it was 79 to 82, I think, or 80 to 83. Uh, just search on my channel, go to the playlists, hit the Dark Table 3.4 or the playlist just called Dark Table, which is all of my Dark Table videos in one playlist. Um, and find the video where I covered this window. It's an incredibly powerful window and it allows you to decide which of the processing modules you actually want to see in this part of the interface. You can actually choose to hide modules that you know you'll never use. With that said, there will always be this active modules on the left hand side and that will show you whatever modules are currently active for this particular image. As you move to another image in your film strip, the list of active modules will change accordingly. I have a bunch of groups set up here, base, tone, color, correction, and effects, but you might choose to have completely different groups set up. It's entirely up to you. By default, down in the bottom left hand corner here, you've got quick access to any presets that you have created in any of your processing modules. You also have the ability to quickly access any of your styles. So if you watched episode 84, you heard me talk about my Instagram frame style. I can simply click on that, click on Instagram frame, and that will apply that frame preset to this particular image. If I don't want it, I go back to the history state, click on the previous history state, and now that frame has been removed. The compress history stack will remove any history states above the currently selected history state. So if you want to go back to this point in time, you can simply click on that history state, click on compress history stack and anything that appears above it will be discarded. Use that with caution, dear new user, because there is no control Z here. Okay. Once you click compress history stack, it's gone and it ain't coming back unless you go and manually recreate all of those other history items. So I will go back to color calibration, compress history stack, and now that framing module has been removed. Next up, we have got display a second dark room image window. If you are using a multiple monitor setup, this can be handy for displaying your image in its own floating window that you might move to a second monitor. That could be handy if you have one calibrated monitor and one non-calibrated monitor. Totally up to you. Moving across, we've got some metadata here that pertains to our current image. Obviously, shutter speed, aperture, focal length, and ISO. What information is displayed there can be customized in preferences and darkroom pattern for the image information line and you will see that it's taking the exposure, the aperture, the focal length and the ISO. So feel free to customize whatever information you would like to see in that field to have that information then reflected at the bottom of 
you know, your image in the darkroom view. Okay, I made myself a promise that I was going to try and make these videos a little bit shorter and this one is going to be about half an hour in length so I'm going to break it up here and we will continue our investigation of the darkroom in episode 86. I will see you then.